So uh, it's organizationally, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a relationship between gauge theory and hyperbolic geometry. So um, I need to tell you aspects of both. With luck, the hyperbolic geometry, I think for this crowd, maybe goes a little more easily. But uh, for the gauge theory, uh, I, I need to describe some fairly technical objects. Uh, and so I need to, what I'm going to do is rapidly on the slides go through the, the Higgs bundle theory that I need. And it's on the slides, which means it's, it's, um, probably a little hard to get in the moment, but so would you, I'll try to indicate what I need you to understand impressionistically about this subject. Um, and then I'll switch to the blackboard when I have things that I actually am trying to communicate. So, um, so this is joint work with uh, 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 Andreas Ott, Jan Svoboda, and Richard Wentworth. Um, in general, uh, so the, the whole discussion takes place, um, S, is going to be, uh, a, you're enjoying this, aren't you? So S is going to be uh, a surface, a differentiable surface on which I will put various uh, structures, um, for instance, conformal structures, hyperbolic structures. And I I'm interested in the SL2C character variety. That's soon I need to actually... Um, so I'm interested in surface group representations in SL2 up to conjugation by SL2, uh, up to SL, sorry, con surface group representations in SL2C um, up to conjugation by SL2C. And uh, here, these representations might be discrete, might not be discrete. Okay, so there's no, um, there's no restriction on having any sort of nice quotient manifold, for instance. And so first I want to talk about a gauge theory perspective on asymptotics in this character variety. And uh, the, the objects that will be, that have been isolated by, um, uh, by these gauge theorists, in particular uh, Rafe Monseo, Jan Swoboda, uh, Hartmut Weiss, and Frederick Witt, are, are these so-called uh, limit configurations, and it'll take me a little while to get what configuration, what limit configurations are, and then we'll have this object, which is describing asymptotics of representations in SL2C, and we'll want to understand what that means geometrically. That's the plan. Okay. So um, uh, I'm going to so describe, give a quick discussion of Higgs bundles in the setting of SL2C. Uh, every, a lot of what I say goes over into SLNC, a lot goes into G. Sometimes, most of the time I'll say two. I, I think I tried to do some N throughout this, but anyway. The first step, and, and this um, is that the first step that, uh, that, that uh, my, the way I was raised starts to conflict with what I'm about to say. So I'm, I'm interested in studying asymptotics of the character variety. And the very first thing I do to study these asymptotics or study the character variety is I make an ad hoc choice of a background Riemann surface fixed throughout. Okay, so why we would do this, I don't know, but you know, or why, why that would be natural, but we're, we, this is what the, happens in the gauge theory. So I have to later interpret this. And so the, the point is that if you have a representation in SL2C, that determines um, through sort of the algebra, um, from sort of algebraic point of view, algebraic topology point of view, a flat rank two bundle over the Riemann surface. Yeah. Um, that's standard. And, and now comes the, the next first psychological leap is that that flat bundle is a bundle with a flat connection. Now, now so the, 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 the flatness originally was in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the the transition functions being able to be, one can make transition functions in the, uh, in the bundle by constant maps, and that made it flat. And now we imagine flatness in a sort of geometric sense as having a flat connection, so that there's curvature of this, of a, there's a, the curvature of the induced connection on the bundle is zero, so that's flat. So now we think about connections. And, and the basic formula governed by Hitchens equations is to imagine this flat connection as decomposed into bits. And the first bit is a unitary connection, unitary with respect to some metric. And so uh, I will have some other connection I'll put on this bundle that will come ar arise geometrically. And then 
I will have two connections, as David points out, if you have, or reminds us, if we have one connection and another connection, then the difference between them is a tensor. So I'll have something left over after isolating this uh, connection that has to do with the metric. And then that, that psi that's left over will break up uh, into two bits. It will break up into a one, a, now referencing the Riemann surface, it will have a one zero part with respect to the Riemann surface, and it'll have a, a conjugate transpose part. Where by conjugate transpose, I mean conjugate transpose with res when, where I, uh, with respect to the say, background metric that gave me that unitary connection. Okay. So, repeating myself, D is the flat connection, um, and then to find this unit, this. Uh, D plus A, this unitary connection, the A part, the D is just differential uh, calculus. Uh, look for a Hermitian metric on this bundle. Now comes the next psychological leap um, for me. So this is a, a sort of personal journey, if you like, as I describe what goes on in my, where I get confused. Um, so uh, we have a Hermitian metric on the bundle. So that means that every fiber I have a Hermitian matrix, right? Or I have a Hermitian metric. So what is the space of Hermitian metrics on C2? It is SL2C uh, mod SU2. So it's like frames mod unitary equivalence of frames. So this ha putting a metric on each fiber is the same thing as describing a map from the surface to SL2C mod SU2, if you like, I'll do everything on the universal cover, and there'll be an equivariant map from the universal cover of the surface to the space of metrics. And the space of metrics is, on one hand, SL2C mod SU2, and on the other hand, we might imagine a geometry for that space. So, let's see what happens next. Okay, the target is just the space of Hermitian metrics. Um, as you know, one of the problems with slide talks is you actually never know what's going to happen when you click the button. So, um, so now I, I want to pick a really good, so I, any map gives me a Hermitian metric. Let's pick a good map. Okay. So the map I want to pick, uh, I'll take this, this choice of metric map, uh, and so this space is some uh, Hermitian symmetric space. I'll take that map to be harmonic into this um, with into this target um, symmetric space with its induced metric. So I choose. So if I choose U to be harmonic, then the um, the, the at every point the connection that I get is the image of that point under the harmonic map, and that gives me some connection, some unitary connection on E, and so that sort of fills in the picture. Okay, uh, as I said, psi is to the, then the difference between the flat connection and this harmonic connection, the D plus A, and as I said, phi is its one zero part, um, and so that's the first setup, okay? So let me, rem so this is the same formula again. Um, the harmonic metric H is enough to induce a whole morphic structure on the bundle. It gives a debar operator if I have a connection, so I have some um, whole morphic structure. And they, because it's harmonic, if I take this point of view, then that one zero part turns out to be whole morphic. Okay? Uh, maybe I'll, so this is a talk that's longer than maybe. That's too bad. Um, okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think I'm jet lagged, <clears throat> among other things. Slip. Okay, so this is still working. That's good news. Let's see if this still works. Um, wow, that's all on tape. Remember that permission I gave for that tape? We're gonna, okay, let's see if this still works. Hey, look at that. Okay, so as I started to say, as I did three things at once, I'm clearly tired because I'm making, well, this is the only mistakes I've made. Um, so for those of you who have never seen this before, let me try a small bit of motivation. Uh, if you have a harmonic function, say from a domain in the plane to R, 
Um, so it would satisfy Laplace in u equals zero, right? And uh, I want to think about the Laplacian as being written, let's say it also satisfy one quarter Laplacian u equals zero. And I can think of writing that Laplacian operator as d bar du equals zero, right? And now we make the following actually deep observation. That's the same thing as d bar of round du equals zero. So what harmonicity implies is that if I look at the differential of the map and I look at its one zero part, that one zero part is holomorphic. So this is a super duper generalization of that. From something harmonic, you expect something holomorphic. Okay. Settle down. Okay. So roughly, the, the Hitchin equations can be summarized in the following way. Um, D is flat. This H metric, which gave us the harmonic metric, is harmonic. And uh, this one zero part of what's left over is holomorphic. And roughly, um, what the Hitchin equations say is that if you're given any one, any one of these three as input, maybe with a little bit more, then you can find the other two. I'm not going to write the equations. But that's a summary of them around the room of people who might yell at me. Oh. Sorry? On the bundle. On E. We okay? We good? Okay. So uh, a Higgs bundle is then a pair, uh, a holomorphic bundle and a Higgs field that phi <laughs> Uh, or if you like, you maybe want to add in the connection, which satisfy, in addition, something I'll, su I'll suppress a bit, a stability condition. And um, the stability condition is enough to guarantee existence of solutions to the Hitchin equations. And so the, the names commonly associated to this to make the whole sort of theory work are Hitchin, Donaldson, Corlett, Simpson. Um, in the late 80s, maybe Simpsons like 1990 or so, 91, 92. Okay. So I have a har so, uh, so I think in the, so harmon I can take this harmonic map. So for every point, I get a point in SL2C mod SU2. I imagine that as a Hermitian metric on C2, that's the metric on the bundle, on the fiber. Um, the map, so that, that SL2C mod SU2 carries a natural metric. So I can do an NA, energy, I'm going to beat this to death now that you started me down it. So it's, it's a, you know, so there's a, an energy minimizer Echbroic covariant energy. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So, in good coordinates, I'm skipping some stuff. Uh, phi, that Higgs field, can be put into this form. I can pr do proper gauges and things. So, and the, the point is that the the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of this uh, tensor of this uh, endomorphism of, so the, the Higgs field is an endomorphism valued one form. So it's a one form whose uh, values are endomorphisms or matrices. So I can look at the characteristic polynomial of that matrix and the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are holomorphic K forms. So this is the version of what I wrote on the blackboard, uh, or one version, is I can extract uh, from the Higgs field, uh, holomorphic forms, and from a, in rank two, for n equals two, SL2C, the, the only invariant is the determinant. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the S is going to make, I skipped something. SL2C will make this traceless, and so I have to put things in good coordinates. So then I'm, so I, I would have a trace and a determinant, but the trace is going to go away because I, I'm looking at, uh, SL2C, determinant one, um, 
um, uh, L, major Caesars have determinant one in, is, uh, in the representation. So the only invariant is this holomorph is the determinant, which when you check tensor types is a holomorphic quadratic differential. It's actually um, classically. So we now have uh, I have had. Um, from what I just said to Kazra, we have a harmonic map from a surface to a space, and harmonic maps of surfaces have a classically defined or classically known tensor associated to them, holomorphic tensor, called the Hopf differential, dating from the 30s, and this is the Hopf differential of that map. Roughly, um, actually more than roughly, see the 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 psi, which is the sum of these two, is the differential of the map. This is the one zero part. Okay, so Hitchin depicts the space of, show my skipping stuff, depicts the space of SL2C representations as, um, as a vibration. Now, uh, I, I'm going to throughout the talk kind of cheat a bit. So Hitchin depicts the space of representations like this. Remember I have this, this X, which is a Riemann surface in the background. So there's a vector space of quadratic differentials, which I can write X, KX squared in the more algebra geometric language. And then over each one of these uh, quadratic differentials, there will be a, uh, a prim variety of line bundles on not X, but a surface related to X and related to Q. Okay. Uh, how, again, I'll use the leisure of the extra 15 minutes and maybe say something about that. Uh, the, the point is, so these are Um, it's the prim differential of line bundles on, I'll say, XQ hat, some surface. Uh, XQ hat, uh, we could think of, so what is XQ hat? XQ hat is the solution in KX, in the canonical bundle, of, uh, of the spectral equation. So lambda uh, times i minus phi equals zero, or if you like, in this case, it'll be uh, lambda squared minus q equals zero. So in, if you like, if we have, if this is x, and then we look at uh, cotangent bundle to x, canonical bundle to x, we'll have two sheets uh, of uh, this, uh, equation will be solved by, have, by a, a double cover over X, which we call the spectral curve, it's called XQ hat. Hitchin describes all the SL2, this character variety of representations of the surface into SL2C as this vibration of line bundles over points. I better add one funny picture here. Sometimes one has sort of singular, uh, that, that, that uh, prim variety may be singular. Uh, that happens actually when the Qs have high order zeros. But anyway, so we have some picture like this. Okay. I'm going to ignore all double cover issues throughout this talk. Okay, so I'm going to confuse X and X hat. Uh, it's, it's a distraction, I think, from what I want to say. And now I'm interested in what happens when we leave all compact sets in this character variety. So what happens, for example, um, when phi or Q Sure. Or it's just, it's, you know, so here's the, the bundle, right? So there's... 
Um, okay, so I'm interested in what happens. So I'm, I'm interested, this is asymptotics morning, so we're interested in asymptotics. So what happens as we look at representations that just leave all compact sets? Okay. So, I mean, the so fibers are already compact, so I'm really thinking about what happens, you know, as Q goes to infinity, as a quadratic differential goes to infinity, um, very much like the way David was interested in what happens when a cubic differential goes to infinity. So here we just have one Riemann surface, the norm of it gets large. Um, so, uh, I mean, maybe what we have is the Higgs field, which remember is the matrix, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to have some fixed one, phi infinity, and I'll multiply the phi infinity by t, and then the determinant will be, just have a t squared in it, and then the t squared will drive the quadratic differential to infinity. I hope that makes sense. Okay, now, first huge simplification. I'm going to be interested only in a sort of generic place. So remember, over these, I have some singular fibers here. So let me, maybe I'll redraw this. So there's some some places where these fibers are singular, and then there's regions where uh, Q, the determinant, has only simple zeros. And that's going to be this, the locus whose limits, you know, over this point, of course I have nice tori, and I'll be interested in what happens when I take, when I look at asymptotics in that sector. All right, so uh, these four authors, Mazzeo, Swoboda, Weiss, and Witt, parameterize an end of the character variety uh, for this portion in terms of what they call a limiting configuration. So the limiting configuration has two bits. It has a limiting Higgs field, and it has a limiting singular connection. Remember, for our harmonic maps gave us a connection, a unitary connection D plus A, or a, so a connection matrix A. Turn character. Anyway, um, and we're going to get out of this some singular connection A infinity. Uh, throughout this, remember that we are leaving all compact sets in the character variety. Things are degenerating. So I have to have, I mean, I have to have reflections of that sort of degeneration somewhere. Here, um, Fine infinity is a Higgs field, it's a plain old Higgs field, but A infinity is still remains a unitary connection, but it develops singularities at the zeros of the quadratic differential. And that's the only actual singular aspect of it, is that it has fairly mild singularities actually at these zeros, but it's, the, the connection develops singularities there. And I think as I go through, I, I hope, if I will implicitly show, describe why one should expect singularities at the zeros. Um, right. And what do these satisfy? So you remember um, phi and A satisfied Hitchens equations. So now I have a sequence of pairs, phi and A, which satisfy Hitchens equations. If you like, put a t, put, if you want to look at t times phi infinity and a sub t, you'd get pairs which satisfy a family of Hitchens equations. Take a limit, you get limiting objects which satisfy some limiting version of Hitchens equations. And that's what they do. So they satisfy some limiting, it turns out to be decoupled versions of Hitchens equations, and that is their limiting object. Now, um, what's remarkable to me, continuing my personal voyage, is that the, uh, the harmonic, which we have a, associated to every connection along the root, to every one of these representations along the root, we have this harmonic map. When we take the limit, there's no more harmonic map. Thing, th things, you know, the representation, you know, if you imagine just take some element of the fundamental group, uh, it's image under these families of representations has degenerated, has gotten in subsets long, right? It's gone very, very, gotten huge or something else, something bad has happened. Then so there's no longer going to be a harmonic map. But what's, so what's remarkable though is that there still is this limiting connection and the connection it has mild singularity. So that's somehow capturing this degenerating, degenerate behavior in a controlled way. Okay. Um, and so one can, for each 
Anyway, so now I have to pass to moduli spaces in order to have a good compactification. What is the moduli space of such pairs? Well, um, the determinant of the Higgs of this Higgs field actually is enough to determine the Higgs field. That's just traceless plus determinant. It's enough to determine it. But if I'm given a singular connection, phi infinity, say, A infinity zero, like you pick one, like maybe it's some sort of like limit of a Fuchsian representation, then um, there are other limiting configurations, phi infinity, A zero infinity plus something. Now, you, you can actually deform in the space of limiting configurations uh, by keeping the Higgs field the same and adding some appropriate tensor um, whose name is alpha. Okay, it's their choice. Um, and alpha, uh, one just works out, alpha is a one form with values in a certain parallel real line bundle associated to phi infinity. Now I'm accelerating. The, the, what you're supposed to get out of this is that alpha is defined, there's some line bundle around that's defined by the Higgs field, and alpha will be uh, closed in there, and uh, so it's a real line bundle. Here's its definition. Um, it is the uh, infinitesimal endomorphisms of the, uh, of the vector bundle E, which commute with the endomorphism phi infinity. And that's what these and you're allowed to perturb in th along those sorts of directions. Yes? Oh, 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 oh thanks. Um, so the, the cross here, or the time sign, is the punctured surface. So, right, so all of these, remember the A, the A infinity singular connection was singular at the punctures, we're going to sort of remove the punctures from consideration everywhere. Okay, so everything is, so this line bundle is on the, um, uh, uh, is a line bundle on the punctured surface. Yes? So this is a real rank one bundle in I think the endomorphism bundle of um, E. Okay, there's it's bundles all the way down, right? Um, so okay. I, I mean, I I think it's not going to be important in the arc of what I want to say, though. Of course, you know when I write a paper, it's going to. Um, so concisely, alpha is some closed form that commutes with phi infinity. Um, we have to worry about gauge equivalence. Um, we can demand that not only be this form be closed, but be co-closed. That picks out a unique gauge equivalence class. He says as he accelerates. So then the moduli space of these limiting configurations is in the space of these harmonic forms with values in this line bundle I've only just briefly exposed you to, up to some lattice of integral periods. I'm going to get some sort of torus out of this. Okay. Um, so... Again, the moduli space of these limiting configurations is some torus vibration over, um, this isn't quite right, uh, the, the vector space of unit holomorphic quadratic differentials with simple zeros. I need to projectivize the quadratic differentials. And that's, that's their boundary. That's the end of uh, this part, all in terms of these analytic objects. So... I think it's a very pretty picture of a portion of the frontier of the character variety. I, I, uh, I have a, a part of a sphere in the base of unit quadratic differentials, and over that I have tori of forms. Okay. Or they have. All right, so here we are, and um, I, I now it's, uh, I think all authors have their own motivations for doing what we're doing. Um, let me now say my, uh, the perspective I'll take for this talk. Uh, the first question is, you know, we're talking about the SL2C character variety. Why do we have to pick a Riemann surface to begin with? The, the character variety is not defined in terms of a Riemann surface. The very first thing we did is made this choice. What's the effect of the choice? 
And, you know, what happens if I take that Riemann surface? Let me make this a little more uh, precise and then change it a little bit. All the analytic objects change. All the harmonic maps change, all the limits change, the limiting configurations change, the phi infinity changes, everything changes. So what is, what is the change of limit configuration map? How would we understand this? That's the first question. The second question is, this entire discussion um, rankles my thirst and tradition um, raising, upbringing. Right? We are talking throughout here about SL2C mod SU2. Um, many of us in the room imagine that as hyperbolic three space. Right? Um, so where in through all this is the hyperbolic three geometry? I mean, that, that would seem like something you would want to fill in. There is no mention in any of the Matthias Svoboda, Weiss, and Witt stuff of any hyperbolic geometry. Though it's been known for a while that SL2C mod SU2 is hyperbolic three space. Okay, oh, that was snotty. Can we take that out of the tape too? <laughs> all right, um, all right. So that's um, those are the questions I want to talk about. Uh, so now uh, let me try to give an answer. Oh no, that's not true. Okay. Um, so I, I, I want to explain a little bit about of harmonic maps. So, I don't know, not formally. The question was one and two are related. No, there's always H3. I have a representation into... Okay, question zero. The whole discussion is about... No, no, actually I'm insisting the other way. It, I think there are two separate questions. What happens, why is there a dependence on X? The question was, aren't one and two related? The what they are asserting they have done is to put some frontier on the space of representations in SL2C mod SU2. It's this picture they are talking about. There is, in this picture, there's no X. It's only their answer that begins with an ad hoc choice of X. Okay. So I, I, in some sense, I think they're separate. But this is a philosophical matter. All right, so I want to talk about harmonic maps. Um, and so uh, let me just review the basics of harmonic maps of surfaces. And what I'll um, suggest or insist is that, in fact, uh, so it all proceeds from one example, which I think everyone knows. Uh, and let me, maybe you, it, it's possible you don't know you know it, but you do know it. So the, the example is um, something that actually David kind of close to talked about was uh, I want to look at harmonic maps from the plane to H2. And here's, my, and here's the very first one. I might have a complex coordinate Z, X plus I, Y. And um, maybe I don't know anything about harmonic maps. I know a little bit about harmonic functions. So I could take... Um, z x plus i y to x, so the real part of z. So in other words, I'm going to take the complex plane, here's the complex plane, and I'm going to map it down to the real line by just choosing the x-coordinate. Well then, I'll, so now I'm on r, so c has gone to r, and here's r, and now r is going to go into hyperbolic two space into some geodesic. So this will be a harmonic function, which uh, followed by an isometry from R into the geodesic, parameterized proportional to arc length. So maybe I don't know what harmonic is, but if it's any sort of natural concept, that map should be harmonic. Harmonic plus I times isometry. So that's a harmonic map. It's actually true. 
Um, uh, let's keep going. Um, we're running to the screen. This should really go straight across. I can map into hyperbolic three space. Let's do this way. Ah. So here's hyperbolic three space. In hyperbolic three space, I'll just include a hyperbolic two space and take a geodesic in hyperbolic in that plane, just take the whole H2, include it isometrically into H3, and the geodesic travels along. And so now I have a map from C into H2, and that's harmonic. So if, um, if you've never seen a harmonic map before, well, yeah, you have, because it's just a geodesic. Uh, let me point something out. So what is the, uh, so the hop differential for this map, actually any map, um, for this map U, for a map, uh, U taking from a Riemann surface into some target, and uh, it is Q, and there's a number of ways of saying this, if you sort of trace through the definitions that I used earlier, uh, you will get the tangent map. So pull the metric back. When you pull a metric back to a Riemann surface, you get a metric on the Riemann surface. It's got a conformal, it's, there's part of the, the uh, metric is conformal to the original Riemann surface and part isn't. So if you look at the two zero part, in other words, the dz squared part, um, that's uh, some tensor. And the point is that this Q is this, hop differential is that Q. Okay. So what is it in our case? Well, so our case was we have C mapping into, um, say, this geodesic, mapping into the, the geodesic in H3. And what is going on is that all of these um, horizontal lines are being taken on gamma, and all of the vertical lines the entire line goes to a single x, so it goes to a single point here. So it's getting crushed vertically. You notice that this map is translation invariant, or actually it's translation vertically invariant, and it's more or less translation horizontal, invariant horizontally. That's just going to slide you along. So whatever this tensor is, it should also have a tra R2 translational invariance. So what can Q be? This implies that Q is just some constant times dz squared. Okay, and so that is the sort of the theory of, of, that I've laid out to some extent for, one, for the harmonic map C to H2. Okay. Um, it's dz squared. All right, so let me now uh, use this to describe, in some sense following up on what David said, polynomial quadratic differentials, and discussion a little bit of Superjoy's question. So then, let me reverse things. So the next simplest map uh, has this Q, this hop differential, maybe let's put a single zero there, Z dz squared. So, um, so let me draw uh, z dz squared this way. I'm drawing the so-called horizontal foliation, which um, there's a reason I draw it vertically. But anyway, so this is, these leaves are places where uh, q of z dz squared, say if I have some vector along here, v, stick v in twice, I get something real and positive. It's horizontal. These are also the directions of maximal stretch. So they accord to these horizontal lines I drew here. Um, and, uh, and so they show up in general as some sort of fo um, foliate. Okay, so what's the harmonic map from C to H2? So what is the harmonic map from C to H2? with half differential uh, does Q equals Z dz squared. Okay, well, so we can figure this out too from the example. The point is that the plane is a really big place. 
Okay. So I, you draw it near the zero, but in fact, you know, the the plane is a very big place, and so way out here, if I look at that quadratic differential, the zero is very far from view, and the map thinks that Q is d zeta squared. That's all, it doesn't see any zeros, it thinks it's exactly this map. So, following up on some of the analysis that David said, um, so what should happen, well, these leaves should, uh, so the map here should be approximately that, the original example zero map of a crushing to a geodesic. So way out here, that, that image should look something very close to a geodesic. Similarly over here, this should look very close to a geodesic. And down here, this should look very close to a geodesic. So the image, so the, the image of the harmonic map with ZDZ squared is an ideal triangle. Right? And similarly, if I go into H3, ideal triangles are rigid. So into H3, that map is st still an ideal triangle. Okay, I'm alighting. I'm skipping something here, which I really like. Um, so I will. Um, I'll say it too quickly to be understood. So the. Uh, I thought I'd do that. Yeah. All right. So, so here's dotted lines. So, so here, here are dotted lines analogous to these dotted lines. I have colors, but I didn't grab them. Okay. So I have these lines, which in some sense are being, having their lengths preserved, orange, and I have blue lines, blue dotted lines, which are getting crushed. Now, you're right, I mean, so these are lines which are getting stretched, and then there are dual lines which are being contracted. And way over here, out here, just look at the foliation, just the orientation of the plane isn't important. Just out here, you're an observer, and you see orange lines going that way, blue lines going this way, okay? Oh, no, it's not crushing down to a T. It is a harmonic map. I, I understand your question. From the complex plane to H2, it has this hop differential. I want to know what that map is. It is not probably not a geodesic, it's probably something two-dimensional. I'm trying to determine what it is. And my point is I'm going to work out, I won't worry about the interior, I'll see what the boundary is. And way out in C, near infinity, it looks like d zeta squared. So it looks, so the harmonic map thinks it's this map. Because it doesn't see any zeros. It feels, it sees translation invariance. So it thinks it's a map to a geodesic, so that tells you asymptotically what this map should look like. Okay? All right, so the part that I'm skipping, and I'll just skip it, um, is, you know, I, I sort of convinced you that this side was a geodesic, I convinced you this side was a geodesic, but of course the same argument holds as you go, as you circle around here. So how did I flip from this geodesic to that geodesic? Um, and the point is that there's a, and this was um, in David, in, in the first work that David alluded to, our 2015 paper, this was an important insight of David's, that, um, that there's a sort of Stokes, there's a, this, this phenomenon is, um, has a Stokes phenomenon characteristic to it. Stokes phenomenon is a well-defined term for ordinary differential equations, and here it's a, a metaphor. So there's some notion of flipping that's important. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have 
I, I love that topic, but I don't have time to uh, go into it. Okay, so now we come to one more example. And, and so you can see what the next example is going to be, and I promise it's the last, because otherwise you'll get nervous. Um, great. Suppose I have two zeros. Right? Suppose Q, so this is example two, Q is Z minus A, complex numbers, Z minus B, DZ squared. So again, I have this picture. Uh, again, I was sort of drawing, so I'm just going to draw some leaves like this. And I'll have two simple zeros, one at A and one at B. And you can sort of see what's going to happen here. If I'm mapping to H2, far over here, it feels like a map to a geodesic. Far down here, it feels like a map to a geodesic. Far over here, and far up here. I did it. Uh, far up here. So I get the image being some sort of ideal quadrilateral. Right? The issue, and well, the issue here though is that um, quadrilaterals are not rigid hyperbolically. So I don't really know what I get. And so if I map to H3, once again, I get some sort of quadrilateral. One, two, I'll use the upper half space. So I'll get some quadrilateral, something like that. Right? I, one edge at one vertex at infinity, and then four edges. And I don't really know what the harmonic map is going to look like into H3. I know what its boundaries will be, but the, and I know that the harmonic maps, you can imagine harmonic is some version of, has some convex properties to it. The harmonic map will map into the convex hull here, have its image, but the convex hull is thick. So I don't really have a good idea for, say, A and B, what the image of this is. However, you know, the, the way I set this problem up, I was interested in what happens as I leave all compact sets. So this is not actually a good example for me. The example I should really be looking at is Q is T times Z minus A, Z minus B, DZ squared. So this picture I drew like this is not like, like that is not the actual picture I care about. The actual picture I care about is something like that, where the zeros are very far away. So now, again using example zero, the harmonic map for T very large, in the middle here, the harmonic map thinks it's mapping to a geodesic. So the image will, in the middle, will start to gather around I use? Mm. Oh, I'll use orange. We'll start to gather around some geodesic in the middle and the geodesic that joins the two opposite vertices that you sort of see here. So uh, it, the harmonic map will start to gather around this interior geodesic and we'll start to see an ideal, an image will be like an ideal triangle coming from here and an ideal triangle coming from there joined along some geodesic. And so that's sort of the picture we expect in the limit for these harmonic maps. So I, I think that's enough of an intuition to begin to see what's going on in this um, uh, in the hyperbolic geometry, these harmonic maps. Oh, I hate smart audience members. Okay, so the, um, the question was, I have some idea how much these things are sheared. In fact, I do. Um, and it's an excellent question. Uh, so let's change the picture a little bit. So the, the shearing is related to that measure. 
It was actually very close to t to the half. So if I have this measure, t to the half times, uh, I did it with a t, yeah, t to the half times whatever that transverse measure is, plus an error that's not just smaller than t to the half, but it's actually exponentially small in t. Okay. Um, that's in some sense a consequence of some of the estimates that David also didn't tell you. So, um, great. Well, from the title of the talk, and you know, I, I think again the way many people in the room were raised, um, this brings us to us our next topic of pleated surfaces. So. Um, now I have to decide how much people know about pleated surfaces. So, um, so what's a pleated surface? Uh, so I, I better say it formally or something. So formally a pleated surface. So this is a new topic which I will then relate to the previous topics. So formally a pleated surface is a quadruple um, everything on the universal cover, let's say uh, F tilde, S, S, rho, lambda. And what I have in mind is I have a map from H2 into H3, uh, and the map is equivariant, is, rho is a representation, rho has always been a rep, sorry, representation, lambda is a, a geodesic lamination, I'll just, for those of you who haven't seen this before, I'll say something in, um, informal in a moment to sort of try to give you an idea about that. So I have some sort of lamination back here. Uh, uh, that's, that's lambda. S is the underlying Riemann, is underlying surface, and that's it. And so the image is, and the conditions are that, um, that F, F tilde on the surface minus the lamination is an isometry, and F tilde on the lamination is an isometry along the lamination. So those are words. I think it's a little hard to parse. The point is that these plaques, complementary domains of the lamination, get mapped into pieces of hyperbolic space, okay, that's supposed to be an ideal triangle. The, 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 in some sense, this is a bad cartoon, but the, the laminate, leaves of the lamination get mapped to geodesics, but not, so they are isometries in the direction of the geodesic, but not necessarily isometries across the geodesic. And so then the, 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 the uh, object kind of pieces together to be a bent hyperbolic surface. This is an extraordinarily misleading picture because um, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, these, the typical cross section of a measured geodesic lamination is a canner set, so you don't really have like a pleat. There's some something more complicated. How does this arise for us? And so these are so um, so these are important objects in hyperbolic three geometry, uh, originally developed by Thurston, probably 1977, 78, something like that. You can find it in his original Princeton notes, for example. So, uh, so, so let me sort of like this isn't logical, but let me say some words that may connect pleated surfaces to some of the other objects that we've talked about. So, you know, again, I have a quadratic differential which has this picture of the maximal, of the maximal stretch directions or the horizontal leaves. So it looks something like this. Uh, let's draw a few more. Uh, this leaf may come down here. Remember, this is on the universal cover. So on the universal cover, you have to be very careful because um, there's a countable number of zeros and they're not going to arrange themselves in some nice way. So, you know, this leaf down here may have, there may be a zero all the way down there. But, let's see, let me do one more. 
Um, oh, I don't know. I'm lost track of this. So I have some picture like that. And this is in H2. And you can imagine in H2, so um, following these leaves down to uh, along H2 till they uh, reach the edge of H2 to the boundary at infinity, straighten the leaves. The leaves will sort of become in packets, which will sort of break apart, so now becoming a... Um, and so the, we get a, a straightened picture that looks something like that. So that we used to have leaves that had things that went off to infinity, and then if we straighten those leaves, they become geodesics. And so these, this foliation on uh, coming from a quadratic differential naturally becomes a geodesic lamination. Okay? Some version of straightening. Okay, I'm going to let that... So... A little more about pleated surfaces. I need one object about one more topic. Oh, I have five more minutes in that. Um, so I have this cartoon I drew of a pleated surface, something like this. And uh, so it's bent. The point of the pleated surfaces is that they are not um, totally geodesic, but they have bends in them. And so we, we would like some notion of how much is it bent. So uh, the, the way one understands this is by a total bending, so that the total bending between what, Bona, what Francis Bonahan calls plaques, so the complementary domains, uh, is given by what Bonahan describes as a bending co-cycle, which is a, a map of you give me a pair of plaques, And I tell you how much you have rotated in going from one to the next, how much bending you've done. A couple comments. Um, there's, there's a real subtlety here. I, I, mean, I draw this cartoon and it's very misleading because as, as we've said, there are um, typically a canner set worth of these things. Why is there a canner set? Uh, if, you, if you did follow this poor description I gave of how to move from a foliation to a lamination, and you think about the universal cover, as we say, there are the, this set of zeros in some fundamental domain will be replicated all over H2. Right? So this zero might have some image way down here. So the leaf sort of corresponding to this, this edge, if you think it's singular, um, will may come, they have an image which comes very close to here. So through any transversal, I will probably have uh, uh, a countable number of the zeros, uh, trajectories coming through a countable number of the zeros, and this is basically a canner set construction. So, um, so that will, when one sort of does this, op this straightening process and takes a limit to get a closed object, you'll get a canner set. So, um, so through here, one bends a lot. So if I'm bending a fixed amount around a particular geodesic, then I'm bending that along the entire geodesic. And so there's a, there's a, there's a lot of like bending around and unbending in between any two. So we can only talk about total variation. These bending co-cycles are 
uh, additively finite, they're not countably finite. Or, sorry, they're finitely additive, not countably additive. Still starting to lose it. One more feature of, so that's an object, um, the bending co-cycle associated with pleated surface. There's one more object which Jinpei brought up, which is if I had, again in a cartoon, if I have, say, two ideal triangles that are meeting on a seam, well, one can ask how much they are displaced. And so if they're displaced by a certain amount, then I can shear along that seam by some amount. Um, let's shear it by S. And then I will still have uh, two ideal triangles meeting along a geodesic or a geodesic lamination, but uh, these particular feet, which would be well defined in terms of the ideal triangle, can be moved so that uh, they've displaced by some shearing. So the, the sort of characteristics of a pleated surface are the amount of bending and some sort of version of shearing. Okay. So here um, are our results. Somewhere in this room is the clicker. Hmm. That's the thing I used to move. Ah, oh, look at that. Okay. Hey. Boy, am I old. Okay. Um, here's our first theorem. Take a family um, of representations heading to or going to infinity, heading towards one of these uh, Maceo Svoboda Weiss Witt limiting configurations. Okay. Um, and so if I have a family of representations, I get a family of harmonic maps to SL2C mod SU2, which I'm going to call hyperbolic three space. Take that quadratic dif the determinant of phi infinity. Remember, we're heading to phi infinity A infinity. We're heading to some, so it's one of these tori over the sphere of differentials. Okay. So there's an underlying phi infinity. Look at its quadratic differential, the determinant. Straighten that the horizontal the foliation to get a measured lamination. And then there is some pleated surface. Um, and this pleated surface, pleated surfaces have a representation. It's not the limiting object. But there's a pleated surface sitting somewhere in hyperbolic three space so that if you shear it by exactly the right amount, and, I, and we know the right amount, you'll be really close to the image of the harmonic map. So this same sort of picture of two zeros with a lot of space between them converging to some sort of bent hyperbolic plane is generally, holds generally, up to the, as Jinpei points out, up to the fact that on these high energy harmonic maps have probably sheared quite a bit. So if you shear back, that shearing back process will converge and you'll have some good pleated surface to start with that if you shear a lot, you're basically you're approximating the harmonic map. So uh, the point is that this family of sheared surfaces approximates the, uh, this limiting configuration. So that's the first, yes. Oh, oh, okay. So Subhadroy asks, am, is, is my rho t given by t times some original base point? Is it a ray in the sort of the, the ray case that David talked about? There's, um, there's a longer theorem. So if, it's a, uh, if it is a ray, then, then I buried some information in that tilde about how close they are. So if it's a ray, um, it's very close. And if it's not a ray, it's a little further away. Um, that's further away, but one can actually sort of distinguish convergence from non-convergence. Okay. Um, and here I've told you what the shearing is. So that's the first. So um, in summary, harmonic maps are well approximated by shearings 
um, of a pleated surface bent along a lamination. And, and that's a, that, that, remember we did some extraction process. We started with this analytic object, the Higgs field. It took its determinant, still analytic, quadratic differential, drew the measured foliation associated to that quadratic differential. And from that, so now we have a topological object, and that topological object was enough, together with some bending information, to describe a pleated, a pleated surface. So um, these, uh, these pleated surfaces that, or this family of pleated surfaces we're talking about are described in terms of topological features of the Hopf differential, not analytic features. Okay? And so that's... Um, So I've, I've just so I haven't talked about the bending angle. I mean, what's let's uh, I only talked to well. So I, I, there's no discussion of the bending angle here. So let me say what I mean. What's going to happen with the bending angle? Remember, an hour ago, um, we had two. We said that if I have two limiting configurations, phi infinity, some basic one. My co-authors like to think of this as the Fuchsian representation, just for psychological reasons, nice and flat. But it could be anything and a different one, somehow something will correspond to something really bent, then the difference between them in this analytic point of view is some harmonic in the sense of the original connection, um, line bundle valued singular one form, something defined from the gauge theory. Okay. Now, so what do I need you to know about this? Uh, alpha is a one form. So one form's got values in a parallel real line bundle. The, the point is, I can integrate one forms. The whole point of one forms is you can integrate them. So using that one form alpha, we can, um, and if I'm back on x tilde, so x tilde, uh, you know, has, I'm drawing this sort of picture. Oops. We can take a path, k, and we can integrate along k. And if you, I'm not, I, you know, I've alluded to e, the neighborhoods of zeros are becoming ideal triangles. So in the, so if I integrate between zeros of this one form, out this one form between zeros that geometrically is somehow discussing a path between plaques in complementary domains. The neighborhoods of the zeros become ideal triangles, and so this path becomes some path on the image surface between ideal triangles, or I should say approximate ideal triangles for the harmonic maps before we take infinity, and we can just integrate it, we get a number. So this gives a number back on the Riemann surface. Now, um, oh, so you can check that that number, that integral, is formal bending co-cycle. Bending co-cycles are characterized by some properties. This is formally a bending co-cycle. So I can formally talk about the total bending of an arc between ideal, uh, between ideal triangles. Um, interiors of ideal triangles. Now, so what this means, so let's take one jump, is that this form alpha determines two pleated surfaces. There is, uh, so what are my two pleated surfaces? There's, this is, there's the pleated surface. If you imagine this phi infinity, A0 infinity as being Fuchsian, as determining a Fuchsian representation so that I'm really mapping to H2 inside H3 and it's, there's no bending at all, then if I change it by an alpha, I can change it by something I can imagine as a bending co-cycle and I can bend it. And so that gives, and by bending this flat surface, I get a new pleated surface that's bent. That's pleated surface number one, and I put the alpha as a superscript because that's the first one. 
there's another pleated surface as well. There's the pleated surface that arises from the first theorem. That's, if I look at the harmonic maps, and I look at the harmonic maps heading to the limit point, don't think of this as a plus sign, think of this as an entire connection. That's the phi infinity comma this connection, this limiting configuration, is a point in the end of this character variety. And I said to each point in the end of the character variety, there's some pleated, there's some pleated surface which determines a family. So I have two different pleated surfaces from the same data. So the theorem is um, that those pleated surfaces are the same. Uh, so I should say, okay, so this theorem, the first theorem is, I'm pretty happy with the, the, the proofs written out start to finish. This one is more written out in fragments that appear to have, appear to be contiguous, um, but it doesn't, so, so, so this one's a partial claim, I think. I better be a little careful. I don't have a, there's one regularity part of this that I'm not, um, it's not written out to the level it probably should be for me to make a claim. Okay, but so the, nevertheless, I believe this is correct. Uh, so these two surfaces are the same. The, yeah, the bending co cycle will be zero and you, know, you, you haven't moved. <laughs> Yeah, so I could just, I, my limit point would, I could just approach it with a flat pleated surface. Okay, so um, there's another way of interpreting, understanding this theorem. If I, um, in some sense, I'm relating bending coast cycles to forms. So in some sense, what we're imagining these alphas as being, what these um, uh, gauge theorists, Seo, Svoboda, Weiss, and Witt are saying is that, um, the alphas are harmonic, and they're also sort of representing bending co-cycles. So this is sort of, if you read the theorem backwards, this is sort of a Hodge theorem, which says I give you a bending co-cycle, you can represent it by a harmonic form in the appropriate, um, in the appropriate setting. Okay, um, the, the final, so, so what's the proof? <laughs> um, the proof is you, at some point you need to, un, you need to relate it's some, you know, somewhere I need to relate hyperbolic geometry and gauge theory. So, um, at the core of the unpacking, I'll just say this. What is going on is, uh, and this follows, there's, I mentioned Donaldson. One of the things that Donaldson did in that seminal paper was to relate uh, connections the, the A, the, the D plus A connections for uh, harmonic maps to, uh, well, for, for representations SL2C to harmonic maps to H3 relating the connections to the Levy Chivita connection on H3. That was like the key thing to do, um, a key thing to do. And what, um, what alpha is basically doing is, I don't know if I can draw this picture. So I have a harmonic map. Here's an image. So, oops. yeah, I'm almost done. So here's my harmonic map, ut of x. And here's the pleated surface it's tending to. And this harmonic map, uh, is foliated by these horizontal leaves of the Hopf differential. This defines a sort of line bundle on the Riemann surface, which is at every point, look at the geodesic, which is tangent to that horizontal leaf. If you remember uh, example zero, the images of those leaves are accumulating near a geodesic. The effect is that that line bundle of geodesics along the harmonic um, image is nearly a parallel line bundle. It's ne it will be nearly L phi infinity. And what alpha is doing is measuring infinitesimally rotation of the image of the map around this geodesic. 
So it, it's that sort of geometry that's at the core of things. Um, and then you unpack. All right, I ran late. Thank you very much. Still in my any, any question? So where do these ideal triangles, how can you see the ideal triangles in the, in the gauge theory side of things? Are these limiting configurations giving you... There's no ideal triangles on the gauge theory side. The point is uh, exactly that, like Z, D, Z squared example. The, um, for large T, the image of the harmonic map is nearly an ideal triangle. Okay, so if you look at any neighborhood here, just fix the neighborhood, take T very large, you get something that's nearly an ideal triangle. And everything over, you know, sort of in the middle tends to a geodesic. I, I'm burying some stuff in that. It's one of the features is that if you shear a lot, then all of those um, geodesics that you're bending along, they all come very close together and very close to a single geodesic. So, so, so the... It's, there's a two ways in which we are thinking of um, of using the asymptotics. One is to get an ideal triangle here. The other is to bunch the pleating loci together into a cord very close to a geodesic. Okay, I have one. Yes. It's going to be very vague. Um, so you have the pleating locus of the pleated surface. Yes. And you have a bunch of surfaces, uh, representations uh, diverging to infinity. Yes. Uh, is the dual artery of the pleating locus related to a limiting representation? Yes. It is. Um, next question. So, uh, <laughs> um, so what is going? So, if you want to, so your question was about um, the. Uh, let me say it this way. So there's this uh, notion of limits com commonly referred to as a morgan Allen compactification, or maybe it is a morgan Allen compactification, where you look at, um, you imagine the representations as converging in some sense to real trees. Okay? And the real trees capture the uh, asymptotic lengths. So, um, what is happening here is I have some um, I have some geodesic I have some curve on the surface, and I want to know how long it is in the teeth representation. Okay, so I draw an arc. Pretend that this point and this point. Um, our lifts of the same point, and this has sort of captured my uh, homotopy class. The image of that arc is, you know, starts here, ends there. How does it, what is the length? Well, this is an ideal triangle, so I can first just take the short direction in the ideal triangle to the edge. Okay. Take the short direction here in the edge, and then, um, then there's some stretch. Well, I can make my way. I should, probably should have done it with. Let's just pretend it's two of them. I can, you know, make my way from one edge, from one center to the other, like this. And this is a finite distance. This is a finite distance. That is very, very long. That's the t to the half that I was talking to Shinpei about. So up to t to the half you have predicted the length. So, so up to some, uh, so there's a t to the half stretching things. There's a, a couple of constants, depend on the homotopy class, but up to, so if you divide by t to the half, you're going to get the length projectively. And so if I divide the entire picture by t to the half, okay, then an R tree starts to emerge. So in some sense, you recover some version of the morgan shalen compactification here. But remember, we haven't said anything about the bending. 
So the, the, what we sort of get out of this is a partial, be, be careful, I'm, I'm tired and I'm going to say things wrong. Um, uh, remember, only talking about this, this sort of uh, pr principal stratum where all the zeros for a particular Riemann surface are simple. So we're, we're avoiding the so-called discriminant locus for that Riemann surface, and then maybe in some sense for all Riemann surfaces. But so we're just looking at a part of it. But um, instead, the morgan shannon compactification is what you might get in this part, in this um, description, by taking those tori and collapsing them. Everything in the tori, all the, what I we're calling alphas, um, are all determining the same point uh, in the morgan shannon compactification. What we pick up here is some notion of the bending angles. There's some sort of refinement. Does that respond? Uh, and any more question? Description of this compatibility uh, that does not depend on the choice of a base Riemann surface. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ran out of... So the point then is that's that's an interesting question, Tangren. What? Hmm. <laughs> well. So um, if we slightly change <laughs> x to x prime, then what happens? Well, phi infinity changes to phi infinity prime. Q and, and um, alpha changes to alpha prime. Okay? And the point is that um, because we are tracking geometric objects with lengths, I can, we can say what phi infinity is. It has the same vertical measured foliation as the, so phi infinity prime on x prime has the same vertical measured foliation as phi infinity on x. It's because, as we're saying to Mahan, the lengths are the same. Right? You have this family of representations, they have lengths. The lengths are predicted by vertical measured foliations. So if I'm heading to a phi infinity prime, it better have the same vertical measured foliation so I can make the same measurements of length, projectively. Um, and alpha, you know, it has the same bending information, sort of you know, uh, imaginary part of the representation in some sense. So I better change to an alpha prime, which has the same periods, because the periods are telling me how much it's bent. So this provides, so in other words, that, that describes the limiting configurations in some topological fashion. Is this saying that For x near x prime, because otherwise I get confused about where the zeros go. Is this saying that the simple surface doesn't depend on x? Saying? The pleated zero? Uh, no, the pleated surface does the laminate the and the bending lamination does but the bending coast cycle and the measurements of and the phi infinity do not I, I keep the same vertical measured foliation not the same horizontal measured foliation we're into the weeds a little bit here I mean I'm deep into the weeds already but yeah. any more question Okay. If not, then let's thank the speaker again.